Thank you very much. Um, I'm here today to talk about courage and what it's like being a young person in Iran today. When I was younger, I probably would have started by talking to you about how Iran is not like Saudi Arabia. For years, every time I spoke about Iran to friends in the West or wrote about Iran for magazines and in my books, uh, or spoke about Iran on television, I would repeat this point. As an Iranian, I'm proud of my country, and it pained me to see it reduced to a cliché, a land of submissive women and the fanatical Muslim men who oppress them. So whenever anyone asked me about Iran, I would repeat this point. Did you know we can drive? We can vote? We don't even have to cover our faces. Did I tell you? We can drive. But I'm not going to start like that today, because over the years, and I have to thank a good friend and fellow writer on Iran, Afshin Molavi, for helping me see it this way, this view is condescending. It traps me as an Iranian into viewing my society from the outside. And it traps people, me as well, into the poverty of low expectations. It's also not helpful in understanding how Iran is different from the rest of the Middle East and explaining how its young people show such courage trying to transform their society into a more democratic place. If being able to drive was enough, Iranian young people wouldn't be waging a quiet rebellion against their rulers, because they can already do that. Iranians expect much more for themselves and from their leaders. And with these higher expectations comes great frustration. I do want to talk about courage, but before I get there, I want to lay out what drives that courage. And it's a combination of anger and those same high expectations. The frustration comes from living under a government that censors what people read, see, and write, that limits their access to the internet and bans sites like Facebook, that forces women to cover their hair, that forces them to wear modest clothing, that prohibits alcohol that imprisons Iranians for praying to a god that the government believes is wrong, and kills bloggers in prison for having criticized all of this. If you're an ordinary young woman in Iran, from the time you wake up in the morning, from getting dressed, doing some research online for a university course, uh, applying some lipstick, downloading some music, walking down the street with a friend of the opposite sex, watching the news on satellite television, every single thing you have done has broken the law. Now, beyond all of these denied freedoms, as a young person, you're also up against an economy with 40% uninflation, inflation, no jobs, a currency that has lost its value, and isolated in a country that's been cut off from the international banking system. So no freedom and no quality of life either. This is called the Iran model, which is something like the Afghanistan model, or a state that fails its citizens in every way. This would be upsetting for young people anywhere, but especially for young Iranians. Iran is a land of poetry and poets who have spoken truth to power for centuries. It is a land of Rumi and Ferdowsi. It is also a land where 50 years ago, women had the right to vote and drive and to divorce and inherit. And it is a land with a hungry middle class of skilled, educated young people who want to engage with their peers around the globe. It also has the world's fourth largest oil reserves and the second largest reserves of natural gas. And it also sits atop the Persian Gulf, which is a fairly important little corner of the world. So history and geography have blessed Iran with great wealth. Iran should be an ascendant power, but instead, its economy suffocates, its government is obsessed with revolution, and people like me, part of a diaspora that is educated, wealthy, and eager to help their homeland, have to say, did you know that we don't have to cover our face? This makes young Iranians angry, and this anger flares up at times, and sometimes it settles down into the business of getting on with ordinary life. Young Iranians are not alone in this frustration. All around the Middle East, young people today are showing their frustration and resisting their governments. In places like Egypt, you can see the violence almost every day on television. But in Iran, young people are channeling their demand for change peacefully. And I don't want to argue that one form of rebellion or resistance is better than the other, that it takes more or less courage, but there is difference. 
If you recall Iran's green movement, an uprising that preceded the Arab Spring, you might remember a day when over one million Iranians flooded the streets of Tehran. They marched silently through the streets of their capital, protesting what was a fraudulent election and demanding that their vote be counted. Why didn't this green movement succeed, people often ask. Why didn't young Iranians have the courage of young Egyptians or Bahrainis to keep up their struggle? When the state cracked down, it's true that Iranians retreated from the streets, that they refused to pursue change through violence. But it's also important to recognize that for Iranians, for young Iranians, their uprising didn't begin in 2009. They had been struggling for well over a decade by that time, resisting the state through daily life. Now, the great American philosopher, Henry David Thoreau, called this business of resisting the state through daily life civil disobedience. As he said it, if the machine of government is such that it requires you to be an agent of injustice unto another, then I say to you, break the law. Let your life be a counter friction that stops the machine. Breaking the law for the majority of Iranians has become as natural as breathing. So going back to all the things I described earlier that are natural and normal for a young person to want to do, but that in Iran are illegal, I'd like to tell you how young Iranians go about defying these restrictions. Playwrights and writers are setting up digital publishing houses that can go around the censors altogether. Designers and ordinary women are challenging the state's dress codes and turning those rules into fashion. Leggings, yes, leggings, recently emerged as a front in their battle. Hardline conservative Iranians who view leggings as a threat, an evil, uh, an evil export of the West, threatened women who wear them with anything from rape to imprisonment. But Iranian women from small towns to big cities went on wearing them. By disobeying the state's dress codes, they sent a more important message. They said that they will not give in to a bullying state, a state that considers their testimony worth half that of a man's, a state that seeks to ban them from studying physics, and a state, a state that considers them ready for marriage at the, age of eight, at the age of 13. They took a moral stance. I want to tell you quickly the story of a young woman, an architecture student called Nina Moradi. Nina ran for city council in the city of Qazvin, a bold move because in Iran, politics is the domain of men. She ran on a platform of change, and she won, but in the end, her win was disqualified because the authorities said that she was too beautiful to be on the city council. This is a sad ending, except for the fact that she ran in the first place. She won, and it was the city council who was humiliated before the eyes of Iran and the world. Most importantly, Nina believed she had the right to be on that city council. She refused to be trapped by the poverty of low expectations. I'll also tell you quickly about other friends of mine who, along with many other Iranians, are working to save the habitat of the endangered Persian leopard. Like the Turkish young people who staged a sit-in to protect Gezi Park, a sitting that turned into an uprising, Iranians have realized that as citizens, they are also responsible for the wildlife and environment of their country. That being a citizen requires giving and not simply taking. And in that, there is great power in claiming ownership over land. It means that you're claiming a stake in your country's future, claiming a stay, claiming a say. And it means that you're creating a fact on the ground. But even ordinary people, by having a satellite dish on their roof, by walking hand in, this hand in the street with a friend, by writing a critical blog, are all engaged in acts of civil disobedience. Just imagine the sheer force of will it must take to struggle this exhaustively, day after day, in every corner of daily life. But years of such effort have helped Iranians develop a social and political maturity a civil society that is vulnerable but wise, and that is tired of ideology and political slogans, and that's concerned with simple civic rights and the right of the individual, the right of the individual to something as simple as privacy. Because their struggle has been a long one, it is today more nuanced and mature. Iranian young people have come to understand that very often meaningful change is not brought about by violent upheaval or bloodshed. I want to pause for a moment and recognize the dark side of, resist of such resistance, because while it seems like a practical way to affect change, it does have a great cost. 
Because in the life of every young person who disobeys these laws, there will at times be consequences. Iranian young people sometimes call themselves the burnt generation for all that they have endured, all of the heartbreak and all of their lost opportunities. There's a great cost to such struggle because daily life as a battleground is exhausting, especially over a lifetime. To fight at the level of a university class while waiting on a street corner for the bus at the dinner table at work, it raises the social stress level far beyond what is normal. It makes people waste their creativity and their life energy on breaking the rules. And it makes lying and hiding feel all too natural. It makes Iranians drive like lunatics. It makes the rate of heroin addiction the highest in the world. It makes them prone to high rates of depression and suicide. It also ruins marriages and friendships. To endure such struggle with your soul intact can often exert great cost. The Iranian musician Shahin Najafi describes this ability as Iranian secret secret the thing that they have developed, the talent they've developed over time, to die while they're still standing up. So as an Iranian, I mourn what the burnt generation has suffered in the course of seeking change. And I mourn the loss the country suffers when all of those young people who cannot bear it any longer leave the country, boarding planes or crossing dangerous borders in search of a life without so much struggle. But I also celebrate the tenacity and courage of those who stay. Peaceful change isn't always the most dramatic, and very often the world doesn't even notice the heroes of daily life. But I would argue that such change over time will be more lasting. Thoreau calls this kind of change the very definition of a peaceful revolution, if any such is possible. Because in the end, change will come to Iran, and when that day comes, Iranians themselves will be ready. It's hard to envision such a moment when the present is still cast in shadows. But one day, Iranian women will be judges again. They will have the right to divorce again. They will have the right and be free and secure, praying to whichever god they consider theirs. Evin prison and its torture chambers will become a national museum. Writers and journalists will go to sleep without fear of tomorrow. And all Iranians, women and Jews, Sunnis and Kurds, Baha'is and gays, will be able to hold their heads up as citizens. Thank you.